Welcome to Hot Tees and the Center for T-Shirt Excellence, where we make your t-shirt dreams a reality. Normally, we would bring our custom apparel experience to you, but since we can't be on site today, we have created an online store that will be available for the next five days. Every shirt is made right here in our shop in Harrisburg, Oregon. Let me show you some of the options that we have. This tie-dye I'm wearing is one of my personal favorites, but wait, it's missing something. That's better. And if tie-dye isn't your style, we have a variety of other options. And we even have jackets and hats. Some say what we do is a little bit of magic, but to us, it is just part of a normal day. We hope you will shop with us online at hotteesapparel.com forward slash Mount Hood Jazz. What began in a small workshop in the Selwood area of Portland over 75 years ago has now grown into the largest piano dealership in North America. For four generations, one Portland family has been honored to serve the piano needs of musicians, schools, institutions, artists, and music lovers throughout the Pacific Northwest and beyond. This is the evolving story of classic pianos and the story of the Eunice family, a family steeped in the love of pianos. It all began when Maurice T. Schuster, a violinist with the Portland Symphony and piano technician, opened a small piano shop that specialized in tuning, servicing, and restoring vintage pianos. Within a short time, his reputation as a master piano technician was well established and the business grew steadily. The growth continued, culminating with bringing his grandson, Maurice Eunice, into the business in the 1970s, nurturing, coaching, and cultivating Maurice's love of pianos and piano restoration. After his grandfather's passing, Maurice continued in the piano business, eventually opening and growing a successful piano retail showroom in Portland and then selling that business to a large national chain. In the early 90s, Maurice began serving as a piano and promotional consultant assisting piano dealers and in early 2001 opened another small piano showroom in Portland with his son Brian under the name Classic Pianos. Soon Maurice was joined by his other sons, Aaron and Taylor. Since that short time, Classic Pianos has grown into the largest and most piano dealership in the U.S. With seven showrooms throughout North America, including Portland, Seattle, Denver, Albuquerque, Las Vegas, Boston, Anchorage, and now serving all of the Hawaiian Islands. Even though the company has grown nationally, at its heart, it is still a family-owned and operated business with the belief that music can change lives for the better. Maurice has often said, we deal with dreamers, professional pianists, teachers, beginners of all ages who want choices. Each pianist longs to find the perfect piano that suits their particular taste and preference. Ask what he means by choices, and Maurice explains it this way. We continue to partner with the best manufacturers and never stop researching to ensure we offer value and quality. We carry pianos ranging from entry-level studio and professional uprights to heirloom models from Berzendorfer, Yamaha, Schimmel, and Estonia as well as a comprehensive collection of nearly new, like new, and restored Steinways from every era. To see how Classic Pianos can serve you and your piano needs, visit us at ClassicPianosPortland.com. Hey! Hey! Hi! It's time to crack an egg. Easy, any style egg works here. Or a smile. Well done, this looks great. Time to share a story. We have a great way to start our discussion. With old friends yeah, or new ones. When you're a caregiver. Time to breathe in. And up. Good job. Then let it all out. Rah! It's never been easier to connect, learn, and have fun. <laughs> Cheers. So let's do it together. Come find us at aarp.org slash near you. Hello. My name is Roland Andrews, Vice President of AARP. And on behalf of AARP and our AARP Oregon team, welcome to the 2021 Mount Hood Jazz Festival. As you know, jazz is a uniquely American art form that is deeply rooted in the African-American Black tradition, culture, and heritage. 
But more importantly than any of that, jazz is just food for the soul. It provides a measure of peace. It can provide a measure of comfort. And it can provide overall healing in a time like this when we need it most. So what I want you to do now is just sit back. I want you to relax and just take in those smooth, comfortable, cool, healing sounds of American jazz. So on behalf of the organizers of the Mount Hood Jazz Festival and your good friends and wise defenders at AARP, welcome to the 2021 Mount Hood Jazz Festival. Thank you and enjoy. Good afternoon. Welcome to the 2021 Virtual Mount Hood Jazz Festival. We are excited to bring you three days packed with interactive webinars and performances from artists around the country. Thank you for joining us for our next session, a masterclass with drummer Gerald Watkins Jr. Before we begin, I would like to thank our sponsors, including AARP Oregon, Clackamas County Bank, the City of Gresham, Classic Pianos, Gresham Sanitary, the Gresham Center for the Arts Foundation, Austin Custom Brass, and Spinella's Restaurant. These sponsors, as well as several partners and supporters, have allowed us to bring this festival to you this weekend. You can visit your, our website for a complete list and, and how you might also be able to help support the festival so we can continue to elevate our jazz community, both locally and beyond. During our session, please use the chat for any questions and comments that you might have, and I will direct them to Gerald as we go. Our next session features Gerald Watkins Jr. Gerald Watkins Jr. is a drummer and percussionist originally from Norfolk, Virginia, and is now residing in New Orleans, Louisiana. He has degrees in music from both Norfolk State University and Florida State University. He performs locally with many of the area's finest musicians and also tours abroad. He has performed with members of the Marsalis fam family, the New Orleans Jazz Orchestra, Dee Dee Bridgewater, Eric Benet, Ledisi, and many others. Aside from performing, Gerald loves to teach and mentor many of New Orleans' young creative minds at the Ellis Marsala Center for Music. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Gerald Watkins, Jr. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, first of all, thank you guys for having me. Thank you guys uh, for everyone at the Mountain Hood Jazz Festival. Uh, thank you guys. Uh, thanks, Dan and Sarah, for having me. I'm looking forward to uh, talking about these things we call the drums and examining the role of the drummer. Um, so I'll, I'll begin this masterclass by um, by telling a story, or or actually um, by uh, reading. I'll, I'll I'll read something I prepared. Okay, so I, I say. The, the drummer is arguably the most important member of the jazz ensemble. The phrase, your band is only as good as his drummer has been preached for many years and for a good reason. Uh, a bad drummer can be so detrimental to an ensemble that it's almost better to play without a bad drummer. Um, I mean, sorry, it's better to play without a drummer than with a bad one. All right, um, so what makes a good drummer? What are these things that drummers do to make the music come alive and feel good? How can a beginning drummer do their job effectively? What can they do to become a seasoned musician? All these things uh, we're gonna talk about today. Um, so uh, as Sarah stated, I, I reside in New Orleans, which is a city full of great drummers. And the, the very first time I came to New Orleans was in the fall of, 2015. Um, and then that week, I got to see many uh, great drummers that I admire. Um, drummers like Herlin Riley, drummers like Jason Marsalis, drummers like Jameson Ross, uh, drummers like Jeff Tane Watts. Um, I also got to see Jeff Ballard. He was in town that week. And, and all these drummers 
the, the, the thing that uh, they all have in common is they they make the music feel good. Uh, um, and and the drummer, in my opinion, that most epitomizes a great feel is Herlin Riley. He is the the godfather uh, of New Orleans drums. And anytime I can see him play or anytime I can talk to him and ask him a question or two, I make sure I uh, take full advantage of that opportunity. So let's talk about some things. So let's talk about feel. Um, what makes a drummer feel good, okay? Um, how does a how does a drummer uh, within a jazz ensemble, whether it be a small group or a large group, how does the drummer make that band come alive? How does that drummer make the music come alive? So here's some things that we're going to first talk about is to play musical time that generates a swinging feel. Um, so you can't talk about jazz drums without focusing on the ride cymbal. All right. That is the thing that most of the band is listening to. That is the thing that um, the focal point of the music and that, that's the thing that kind of draws everyone's ears inward. That's the thing that kind of unites the band is the ride symbol. Okay, so we're, we're gonna start with talking about uh, demonstrating a, ride, a good ride symbol beat. Um, so the first thing about playing the ride symbol is making sure that the sound of the beat is consistent, meaning that you're playing in the same area, uh, meaning that the space between the beats are consistent, um, meaning that the volume of the beats are consistent, all right? So the first thing I'll do is I'll demonstrate how uh, one would go about developing a feel on the ride symbol. Um, this could be done with a metronome and without the metronome. I, I, I recommend doing both, all right? So the first thing is, um, even before we attack the cymbal, is how do we hold the stick? We don't want to choke the drumstick. We kind of want the, the, our fulcrum to uh, give us the control we need and these uh, following three fingers to give us the support we need so the stick can move freely in our hand but not uh, loose enough where it falls out. So what I'll do is I'll demonstrate how to just strike the ride cymbal. You wanna start right in the sweet spot, right in the sweet spot. Uh, I don't know if we can get the other ca camera angle, but we wanna play right in the sweet spot, not in the bell, not too far in the edge, but right in the middle. So now that, now that we have a consistent sound, now we want the time to be consistent, all right? So here we go, I'll play uh, four quarter notes, or actually I'll, I'll play a little bit longer. I'll play um, 16 quarter notes, here we go. One, two, three, four, two, two, three, four, three, two, three, four, four, two, three, four. Now, in jazz music, we have we have what's called the skip beat. All right, that is the uh, uh, and of two and of four. One, two, a uh, three, four, a uh, one. 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 All right. So once we develop a consistent sound, a consistent feel, we want to start incorporating the other members of uh, the drum set. All right. So what I'm going to do now is a technique that's called feathering the bass drum okay all the these are the elements that we're using the riot cymbal the bass drum uh we'll later add the snare we'll later add the hi-hat these things um we're creating a groove from these moving parts okay so this is what i'm gonna do actually you know what i'm gonna add the hi-hat and we're gonna lock it in on two and four here we go one two uh three four oh uh, one two uh three four oh uh, one two a uh, three, four, a uh, one. Two, a uh, three, four, a uh, one. And when I play the ride cymbal, I put a little weight on the two and four. Okay, I don't, I don't have a full blown accent there, but a little, I, I kind of nudge that beat just a little bit so there's a, a slight, a, a slight accent on the two and four. 
And that's also being reinforced with the hi-hat, all right? And now one of the most important things about playing jazz drums and, and developing a good feel, and I would, I would argue that's one of the most important things, is feathering the bass drum. In jazz, especially with uh, when I see young players um, in, that are still in high school or maybe their earlier years in college, they have a problem um, with feathering the bass drum. And I understand because I had that same problem, okay? Uh, feathering the bass drum is what reinforces the beat. It adds a low sonic frequency to your sound. It gives your sound weight, okay? It gives your sound, um, it's this intangible feeling of, of solidarity. It, it, it gives it the support um, and, and the low frequency to balance out the high frequencies of the cymbals, all right? So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna feather the bass drum on four beats. We're gonna play two and four in a hi-hat, and then we're gonna play um, the ride symbol beat on uh, the ride. Here we go. One, two, ready, and one, two, one, three, four, uh, one, two, three, four, uh, one, two, three, four, uh, one, two, three, four, uh, one. Now, that bass drum, it shouldn't be dominant, it shouldn't be. You're feathering the bass drum. So that means you're playing in a manner where the beat is more felt than heard, okay? So we'll try it again, all right? We wanna keep the sound of the bass drum under the sound of the riot cymbal and under the sound of the hi-hat cymbal. So we'll do that again. One, two, ready, and... Now, once we get that together, which takes time, then we add our snare. We add our snare to add some spark, some rhythmic spontaneity, um, some spice, if you will, to our beat um, with different uh, comping patterns, with different um, accents, with different things that might highlight the melody, um, things that might set the band up for different figures within the music or different things that might, um, you know, trigger the band to create a, uh, to play a response back to you. All right. So we'll yeah. yes. Before you jump into snare drum, this is maybe, this is a question from me. We haven't, I haven't seen anything from the chat yet, but okay. uh, I was, I've taught middle school band for 10 years and all band right. Band. So this is more of a, from a teacher perspective, if there's okay. students watching, but that, that leap from no bass drum to feathering the bass drum is such, I mean, you do it so elegantly. Like I, f for a seventh grader to do that is like, a, it's just such a monumental leap. <laughs> yes, it so, is. It, besides like telling the kid to go take private lessons, you know, what, what are, you know, cause the band director is always looking for a little, you know, nuggets to, to plug into their, you know, to what they're telling their kids every day. So what, what are some things that can help, you know, okay. a band director yes. get feathering down because that's so hard. <laughs> No, no, believe me, uh, seventh, a seventh grader is going to struggle with this because I struggled, I struggled with this well into college um, because the way we learn drums and usually the music we come to drums with is usually a music that's based in a backbeat or a pocket, usually funk or rock. For me, it was gospel. Um, for others, it you know it, it might be a different type of music, and and, and usually those musics, those music, uh, those genres of music, the bass drum is the focal point, you know. So they they're used to playing. Uh, you know, and a, a music that requires a heavy bass drum. Jazz, the hierarchy of sound is not built from the bottom up like many um, other music. Uh, many other genres of music that that are based in funk. The hierarchy of sound in jazz is built from the top down. So it requires a different technique. We call this the heel down technique where the if this is the uh, if, if these are the toes and this is the heel of, of a drummer is to keep that heel on the ground and play flat footed rather than playing heel up. So heel up is what generates the power and a lot of sound um, that a lot of drummers have a have a problem with when coming to jazz. Learning how to play heel down and controlling 
the ball of their foot, being able to control the volume in their foot is a thing that takes many years to master. So um, you just have to be patient with the seventh graders and tell them tell them to, to try playing with their heel down, okay? Not with their heel up, play with their heel down and use uh, the front, the top, the front part of their foot, their, uh, the ball of their foot in their, in their toes to generate the power rather than generating power from the heel. That's great. Cause man, like you said, that is tough. It's tough. It's tough. Yeah. My, you know, my, my, you know, go-to is always to just say, okay, don't play the bass drum. <laughs> oh, no. They have to play the bass drum. You, they have to, that is, yeah. that, that is so, that is so important. And, 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 a, and a lot of times because, um, they they don't know how to control it. I've, I've seen a lot of band directors do that. It's like, okay, you can't control the bass drum, just don't play it. But yeah. what what that when they when they're not playing the bass drum, the band can feel that a, a good a good especially if it's a big band, um, mm-hmm. even 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 in small group, you know that that sonic frequency that you get from the bass drum is an intangible thing that you know that we that we a lot of times miss. In, in 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 big band drumming. Um, so yeah, I need somebody. Need, I need to write a book on 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 feather in the bass drum. <laughs> yes, please do. <laughs> well, it, this is a common problem, yeah. so do not feel bad. This is a common yeah. problem. I struggled with this thing for many many years until I I finally got it together. I think your your comment about you know them he they they have rock music in their ears you know and that's what they're coming to it. So like making sure that they have jazz in their ears. Also, you know, to, to get to get that sound, you know. Yes, because we're going to talk about that, too. We're definitely yeah. going to talk about that because we're products of our environment. Mm-hmm. Uh, I grew up in a, in, a, in a heavily gospel music family. You know, my, my mother was an organist. My father was an organist. Um, my mother um, directed the choir as well and led worship at our church. So the music that. Uh, I grew up on was, you know, mass choirs, Chicago mass choir, Georgia mass choir, you know, and, and the way you play drums in, in, in those groups are a lot, it's a lot different from the way you would play in a, in a jazz group. So when, when I, when I started learning jazz, I had to flip my whole mentality on how I approached the drums. Great. All right. I don't see any other questions. So if you want to, let's hear about the snare, let's do it. All right. <laughs> All right. So now, now that we we we, we feather two and four, uh, ride simple pattern. Now what we do is we're going to add the snare, and the snare doesn't have a locked in rhythm. The snare's rhythm is dictated upon what's going on around around us. So if we have a a, a melody, um, if we have um, some some type of figure in in the band or some type of um, rhythmic motif that that that's being played. The snare is usually used to accentuate that thing. So what I'll do is I'll play, I'll comp on the snare drum um, and I'll comp some different uh, figures that um, that are simple and then maybe might go into something that might be a little bit more complex. All right, here we go. One, two,
And now, those are things that um, take time to develop. Uh, usually what I do with brand new students is we, we, we start with playing time. We have to generate a good feel because even the song, um, it don't mean the thing if it ain't got that swing is the truest statement ever when it comes to drums. You know, you can't, you can't play jazz music without, you can't effectively play jazz music without a swinging feel when it comes from the drums, okay? Um, so let's talk about a couple more things uh, that, that, that generates a, a swinging feel. is the ride cymbal beat that's consistent, uh, a strong sense of groove that we were talking about, um, forward momentum, okay? This is, a, this is an important thing when it comes to jazz too. It's playing forward, and, and I don't mean rushing, I don't mean um, playing frantically. I don't mean um, playing with anxiety. What I mean is playing forward in the time um, to, to make the music feel like it has an edge to it. And this is a hard thing. This is a hard thing to develop. It's, it's actually a hard thing to teach because this is a thing that's personal to every drummer. Every, everybody's feel, you know, I, I named Herlin Riley and I named Jason Marsalis and I named, um, you know, Jameson Ross and a lot of other great drummers that live here and reside here in, in New Orleans. But everybody's approach to forward mom momentum is different. You know, everybody's approach to uh, playing time is different. So I'm pretty much uh, describing this from my perspective. Um, so I see playing forward in the time as giving giving the band a nudge, giving the band uh, 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 a jolt of energy. It's like almost like, um, you know, wait, making sure that they're not falling asleep. So let's talk about some ways that we can play forward in the time. Um, one thing that I do um, to create some forward momentum is playing upbeats. You know, in, in, in music, we have downbeats and we have upbeats. So a lot of times I'll play a lot of upbeats um, in the bass drum. Um, I'll play a lot of upbeats in, in the snare drum um, to create a little bit of anticipation to create some uh, rhythmic spontaneity. So let's I'll demonstrate real quick about how to play forward in time and I'll play some some upbeats uh, to kind of generate a forward feel instead of instead of crashing down on a one. I'll play on the and of four. You know, instead of resolving, resolving on 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 dominant beats, I'll resolve on some upbeats that kind of that kind of keeps the music in the air rather than rather than bringing it down to earth. Okay, so uh, I'll de I'll demonstrate that for a second. One, two, three. <laughs> So those are some small things to do, and especially at a slow tempo, that's a thing that's 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 hard to develop because you want you want the tempo to not rush, but you want the tempo to be before you want to play forward in the tempo. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later too. All right, so we talked about balance and control of the limbs, um, and to have a good sound that's based in. Um, Technique. So that's just the drummer by itself. That's the drummer in his practice room. That's the drummer who is learning these things on his own. So we haven't even talked about the music yet. We just talked about the basic technique of playing the right cymbal beat, the, the, the swing beat, um, so to speak. Now, uh, the second, the second thing the drummer must think about is the players around him. So now the drummer must not only feel good playing by himself. Now he has to play with the bass player. Now he has to play with the piano player. Now he has to play with the horns or, or with, with any other wind instruments that might be uh, accompanying him. Okay. So now we have to talk about things like comping behind solo, uh, soloists. We have to talk about accentuating the hits within the music. 
controlling the tempo and the dynamics. Uh, we also have to talk about knowing the appropriate sound of the music. So after we get our stuff together in our own private practice room, you know, we, 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 we feel confidence because I can, I can play a ride simple beat at different tempos. It feels good. I've been practicing with my metronome. I've been practicing with records. Now I'm ready to play with other people. Okay. Um, and let's talk about that. Um, now the, the, the very first thing that the drummer has to do um, is lock in with the bass player. The drums and the bass are married. All right. And, and for, for a marriage to be successful, there has to be give and there has to be take. Okay. We have to, you have to give a little bit, you have to take a little bit. Um, and so when it comes to, when it comes to playing with the bass player and also with the piano player, the debate, the, the uh, usually the bass, the drums and the piano make up the rhythm section. Um, and so when it comes to negotiating the time, um, we have to talk about, okay, the, the relationship with the bass player um, and how he interprets the time or she interprets the time and with the drummer and how he or she um, interprets the time. And we'll talk about this in different ways because uh, when it comes to big band drumming, there's a, there's a little difference than when it comes to, to small groups. So actually, we'll, 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 we'll delve deeper into that once we start talking about big band versus versus small drum um small group drumming but that's one thing I, I wanted to highlight we have to learn how to interact and play with other musicians the bass player the piano player the guitar player horn players that um you know whatever whatever the ensemble consists of um creating rhythmic spark we talked about that energy that inspires the band um rhythmic improv improvisation spontaneity um also, one thing we'll talk about later is even um, we'll, we'll we'll talk about a little bit of soloing. But what I really want to want to hone in is is the fact that you have to have a good feel and a good time um, before you can even think about soloing, because that's usually what most young drummers want to talk about first. They want to talk about how do I sound like Tony Williams. You know, how do I play, you know, incredible, you know, 30 second notes across the drums? How do I, you know, wow the audience and get a standing ovation with my drum solo? And those things come much later once a, a drummer has a good foundation in in the basics. So uh, let's talk about going back to playing time and playing with the with the band let's let's specifically talk about the big band. OK, I'm going to break this down into the big band and the small group and and if anyone ever ever has any questions while i'm talking about this i will gladly stop and expound on something that might um that you might need a, a little bit of extra explanation on okay um so big band drumming big band drumming big band drumming drums are the most important instrument of the big band you can't you can't do big band without the drums drums are the engine of the big band um a plane can't fly without a pilot. You know, a, a football team can't move the ball down the field without a quarterback. You can't, you can't do it. You can't have big band without drums. So, you know, you have to, uh, uh, the drummer's responsibility in the big band, is, he has the hardest job. He really, he really does. So for you middle school teachers out there, uh, for you high school big band teachers out there, just, just be patient with your drummers. I promise. I promise. Just be patient with them. They have the hardest job, so it's it's gonna it's gonna take some time for them to develop these things. And hopefully, um, you guys will learn some things from from this this master class that I, that I help you when 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 teaching them. So, so let's talk about uh, the feel. Uh, I can't stress this enough. Please, 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 please. Um, Make sure that your students are playing with the records. That, that is the ultimate source of jazz knowledge. It's the records. A, a lot of the people that we listen to, a lot of the drummers that we emulate, never, um, never step foot in a music school. A lot of these guys, they learn these things um, by first going out to hear other players play and being in inspired. Um, 
and also by hearing them on records and being inspired and wanting to emulate that sound. So for all you um, band directors out there and that are teaching, whether it be jazz combo or big band, whatever it may be, please have the kids learning and playing along with the record. That is going to teach them and, and, and get the sound. We were talk, Me and Sarah were talking about what was talking about earlier, having the sound in your ear. And you can't emulate the sound if you do not have it in your ear. So the very first thing is to play along with the record. And um, I also have a PDF and I, and I didn't, I didn't send it over, but I, I, I'm going to also send this PDF that I'm, that I, I typed up for this masterclass just so you guys can have it um, and, and, and use at your disposal. Okay. Um, jazz is an oral tradition. So playing along with the records um, um, is, 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 is cause a lot of times we, we don't have a lot of big bands playing locally in, in many of our cities. Um, I'm spoiled in new Orleans that we still do, but in, in a lot of cities in America, there aren't, many bands playing. So playing along with records, mimic, mimicking the sound and the feel, um, um, the process of trial and error. Okay. So we, we, and we also talked about earlier is developing coordination and control between the limbs. So the groove is never um, disrupted. You know, um, coordination exercises can be found in books. And also with this with this PDF, I, I typed up a list, I, I typed up a page of resources that you guys can order for your students um, and, a lot of, and a lot of good books that can accompany the records that they're listening to and playing with um, so they can get an idea of what's going on and, and, and they can get a visual, um, they, 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 can, they can learn visually and, and kind of see, okay, this is what these drummers are doing, all right? Um, we talked about feathering the bass drum, you know, especially in the big band, that weight, that weight of the bass drum is, is so needed. Um, right now I'm playing with a, with an 18 inch bass drum, but usually in big band, I'll play, I'll play with a little, uh, a, a little, um, a larger size, um, bass drum, whether it be a 20 or a 22, um, because that, that quarter note pulse is what, is what, is what needed. It's what's needed in the band. Okay. Um, so the marriage between the bass drum and the bass player, okay? So in big band, we put a little bit, we put a little bit um, more weight uh, on the bass drum to kind of, uh, kind of have a, a lower, a lower sound. Because think about, think about a big band. We have, you know, four trumpets, you know, three or four trombones, five saxophones, um, piano, bass, drums, guitar. You have a lot of high pitch instruments. So what you have to do in big band drumming is the drums are usually tuned a little bit lower to kind of give some weight to the, to the band, all right? So when, when we're feathering in, in a big band, we kind of want to play a little bit, a little bit louder on the bass drum just so the band can feel that beat. Being committed to the groove, being committed to the groove. You know, a lot of drummers, I see a lot of drummers, especially young drummers, when they play rock and roll music or when they play funk music or when they play hip hop or R&B or gospel music, they play with so much intention. Um, they play with, with, with so much conviction. That same intention and conviction must be brought to the bandstand when playing jazz. Jazz, playing jazz music doesn't mean playing light and timidly and weak. Um, jazz music means, because all, all, all those other musics that we, I just mentioned, they, they, they come from jazz. They're, they're a distant relative um, of, of jazz, of jazz music. So it has to have that same vigor, you know, especially like grooves that we play in, in the big band, like the shuffle. Oh man, you can't play a shuffle. You can't play it weak. You can't play it timidly. 
It has to be, it has to be strong. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about that Art Blakey Shuffle because this is a common groove. We'll, we'll go into some common grooves that we, that we have to play in the big band. So that Art Blakey Shuffle, when, when we listen to Art Bla- uh, Blakey play uh, Monin or, 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 or Blues March or any, any, any of those things that where, where, you, where you hear the Art Blakey Shuffle, it's, it's powerful. It moves you. It makes you want to dance. It makes you want to get up out of your seat. It makes you uh, want to grab your grab your partner and, 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 and hit and hit the and hit the dance floor. OK, so um, the weight, the weight of that, uh, that art break you shuffle is in that two and four. You got the shuffle beat going on in your in your left hand, but the weight is on that two and four. It's almost like you're in, you know, you have to imagine that you're in some blues club, you know, somewhere in the in the, in, the, in the sticks, you know, somewhere in the country, you know, and, and, and it's a dim lit club and it's like red lights and it's just, you know, uh, you know, it's a, it's just, a, it's everybody, it's, 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 a, it's a packed club of people dancing. And you have to think about that when you're playing, when you're playing jazz, uh, a jazz shuffle, because it's that, it's that same type of feeling because it comes from the same place. All right. So I'll, I'll, I'll demonstrate the Art Blakey shuffle. All right. And give it that same intention. It has to move. It has to, you know, make you want to snap your your fingers. It makes you want to, you know, keep. You gotta, you gotta have the the, the head nod, the head nod. The I was head. getting up out of my chair on that one. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Because that's what it's. That's what a shuffle is all about. You know, it's a, it's yeah. a it's a it's a groove that kind of uh, is conducive to dancing. You know, it, it, anytime you hear it, it's just like, oh, okay, I, I, you know, I, I feel like I'm at a bar or something. I, <laughs> you know, like I, I need, I need to, I need to get out there. You know, so that's a that that that's one of the most common grooves that we uh, have to play in the big band, and it has to be done right. That was really good, like being able to watch you do that from up above. You know, mm-hmm. and seeing your technique with both hands, because I mean, again, like you know, my world is middle school jazz band. That is hard <laughs> it's a hard it's, it's yeah. a lot of coordination involved and and, yeah. and that left hand has to has to keep uh the shuffle going but also accent the beat you know so it's playing a shuffle rhythm under it but you're accenting two and four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One. All right, and I'll, I'll play the whole beat together. Here we go. So, so tell your tell your kids when 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 there's a tune when there's a tune that you guys get and and, and you see uh, at the top left hand corner jazz shuffle, just tell them to go listen to some Art Blakey, Art Blakey, Art Blakey, Art Blakey, Art Blakey. For sure. Art Blakey. Um, some um, other thing. Go ahead. Go ahead. We have a question in the chat that um, that came up. It's not 
um, really related to the to the, what we're talking about right now. Okay, so I don't know, do you want it now or do you want it? After? Yeah, yeah. Let's go ahead and talk about it now. I I, I know where I am. So once we're sure. finished the question, yeah, I, can and go I have back. all yeah. sorts of questions about this too. So, okay. <laughs> well, um, so DKNY or says, how did Gerald get involved into choosing the drums? Why did you choose drums? I didn't choose the drums. This is what happened. This is what happened. This is this is a, this is a true story. Um, like I like I, I, I stated earlier, my mother and my father are, are both church um, organists and piano players. So, uh, I, you know, a lot, a lot of people thought I would play the piano um, and actually it was the first instrument I played. But um, one day after church, my parents made the mistake of sitting me on some drums. And my mom tells me the story all the time. You know how moms like to tell us stories over and over again. My mom told me this story and she tells me this every year. Um, I, I picked up the drumsticks and I just knew what to do. And they just knew from that moment, okay, this this kid is going to be a drummer. And that's honest to God truth. I really didn't choose. I don't remember starting to play drums. All, I don't remember life not playing the drums. The drums chose you. The drums chose me. Yeah. That's great. Drums chose me. Yeah. So not, not a, not of a, a long story is, 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 is as simple as that. You know, they sent me on some drums. I was two years old and they, I picked up the sticks and I just knew what to do with them. So. That's great. <laughs> Any other questions before I jump back in? Not, not in the chat. Um, but I, I would love to get back into the big band drumming. Uh, okay. Theme. I don't know if you're going to talk about this or not, but um, setup like in the big band. I mean, sometimes you're kind of at the mercy of the venue, but mm -hmm. you know, when when you're sitting in the rhythm section in the big band, even in relation to the band, like where do you mm -hmm. like to be? Where's where's the ideal spot? Like if I'm setting up my middle school jazz band. Okay. Where do you want to be? Very good question. Um, I love to be in the middle of the band. All right. Um, I love I love uh, being tucked in. Uh, I, I love the feeling. I love feeling the closeness of. Um, that's why I love playing in small clubs because you have to be close. Um, large stage, the band. A lot of times, the band is spread out. But um, my ideal setup is um, to have the horns to the left of me so you'll, you'll have a, the row of um well I, we do this we do this two ways i play in two big bands here in new orleans and the setup is different from both so in the new orleans jazz orchestra the drums literally sit in the middle of the band so we so say this is you're you're in the audience this is me okay uh forward to my right which would probably be your left would be the saxophones all right and then facing inward so the saxophones right here playing inward the trumpets i mean the trombones front line of trombones and trumpets are playing inward okay so the conductor is right in front of me the saxophones right here playing inward trumpets playing inward trombones playing inward behind the saxophone the saxophone section is the piano and then right beside me in between me and the piano is the bass. So I am literally the center point of the New Orleans Jazz Orchestra. The, the, the drum sits, the drums sit right in the middle of the band. And I love that because everybody's playing inward. So the sound is coming in. So it's, it's really easy to hear everybody. Um, and that's one of my favorite ways to play. And then I, I, when I play with, um, when I play with uh, Uptown Jazz Orchestra, that's that's led by Delphio Marsalis. Um, the the setup for big band is the traditional setup with saxophones on the front line, um, trombones on the second line. Back line is the trumpets, and that's all to my left. I'm right here. All right, um, right right next. So so I can I can literally touch. You know, this is probably fourth trumpet. I can literally reach out and touch him because he'll be right here and then bass on my right and um, piano right there on, on um, um, also on my right. So that those are the two different setups that I'm, that I'm accustomed to, to playing. I like the flying V. The, v, uh, the flying that's, V that's is really cool. <laughs> it's ideal because every, everybody's sound is coming in. When 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 we play in the traditional, it's, it's a lot of times it's really hard for me to hear the saxes, so I, I have to play in a way where um, I can hear what's going on. Um, and and they're playing, you know, they might they might stand up to play a solo, 
you know, and their body is shielding their sound and, and their bell is facing this way. And it's already a woodwind instrument, you know, you know, so so that, so that their sound isn't, you know, as, as powerful as a, a trombone or a trumpet, which I have, usually have no problem hearing. It's those saxophones that are, you know, and, yeah. you know, that are sitting way up here. So um, I have to play in a way where my sound is still under them. I can still interact and actually know what they're doing but when everybody's in that v playing inward oh man oh man it's like it's it's perfect it's like apple pie and some ice cream <laughs> it's 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 great it's great. great yeah like i said i know sometimes you're at the mercy of whatever venue you're at like yeah. you know thinking like at a jazz festival when i'm taking my band you know i kind of gotta set it up whatever way they're telling exactly. me to set it up but but don't don't feel like if you ha please like move the chairs in right. like play as right. close together as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. Snug Snug Harbor forces our, the the big bands to play close because the stage is small. So the the big band we're literally literally like the trump the hi hat stand right here is right here. This is the fourth trumpet player like literally standing right over my shoulder. So he's literally right here. Same thing in Snug Harbor, you know, the, the floor time is right here. This is literally the bass play. I can reach out and touch the guys on the opposite end of the band, you know, so it's a small stage. When, when we're playing with the New Orleans Jazz Orchestra, we're, we're, we're playing at a, at a bigger venue. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot more spread out, but everybody's sound is coming in, which kind of compensates for the space. I think too, sometimes like, like for students, you just have to give them permission to move. Like it's okay. Yeah. To, it's okay to move where you need to move to get your yeah. best sound, you know? So it's drummers too. I feel like a lot of times drummers will get on stage and they're playing a backline kit or whatever. And it's like, mm -hmm. you, know, you can move it the way you, you want. You can it. move it. Yes. Yeah. And a lot of times for drummers, like, and, and they, they do this a lot. They'll put drums on a riser and you, yeah. just, you just feel so far away from everybody. Uh, and, and, you know, and that and that's cool. You know, I, I've played in a lot of situations where drums are, you know, separated because people come to festivals and, you know, you want to see the drums. I get it. I understand. <laughs> I understand. But um, for me, if if it was, if, if, if I had my way every at every festival, I would be on the floor with everybody else just tucked, nestled, nestled in there. I can hear everybody. I don't, I don't feel like I have to play loud um, because sometimes you're in the situations where you're in situations where the monitors aren't the best. So yeah. if you can just hear everybody just acoustically, that makes everything so much better. For sure. Well, thank you. That was that was a burning question in my brain. Oh, <laughs> we only have about yeah. we have about nine minutes left. Okay, I'm gonna try to I'm gonna try to zoom like through so this because I haven't even really talked about the small group. We're still on the big band. I know, like I, I know. This, this this hand man, I I typed up about six pages. I I need to send this to you guys. So yeah, we were able to. I grabbed your link and we were able to put it in the chat. So anybody who's on listening or watching right now should be able to download the Dropbox. Um, okay. Page. So great, 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 great. Um, so we, we we talked about common common grooves in the big band. So I guess we'll we'll just we'll just only talk about the big band. You guys can read more on the small group. And and big band is more common in school, uh, especially uh, for younger younger musicians as well too. So we'll we'll, we'll kind of focus in on the big band before we have to leave. Um, so breaky shuffle, the second most common. Well, I'm saying most common. An, another common rhythm that we have to do in the big band is chop wood, okay? Chopping wood is that two and four on uh, the cross stick of the snare and the rim and finding a good sound and getting a good pop, okay? You want that, you want that two and four, you want that thing to cut through the band because you, you want the band to just lock in and, and clap. You know, this is, this is right here reminds me of church. You know, I, I grew up in the... I grew up in a Pentecostal church, uh, playing drums in a Pentecostal church, and you know you you have those you have those those old mothers, you know, clapping that hand, and, and they and they they always had those that 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 pocket when they clap their hands, they just had that just 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 that that perfect that perfect pop. Same thing you have to get on on the, on the drums. So uh, I'll demonstrate what what chopping wood uh, should feel like within the big band. Here we go, one. Two, one, two, three.
You know, like that's that is that is count Basie. You know, that all day you, you can't play Basie without being able to chop that wood. Got to be able to chop that wood, or 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 or, or Duke, any any of those traditional uh, big bands. You gotta you gotta be able to chop that wood. So making sure you get that good pop. You know, getting the meat, the meat of the stick, not too far inward, not too far outward, but getting the good the meat of the stick right uh, on 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 the uh, on the edge of the snare. All right, uh, we'll move quickly. Uh, playing in the two field. A lot of young drummers don't know how to play the two field. All right, and it's usually uh, it's, it's it's as simple as counting to two. And playing the two field leaves a lot of space within the time, which gives a lot of young drummers anxiety about, oh my God, why is there so much space in the music? And I understand. But once we learn how to play the two field uh, effectively, it helps uh, it, it helps the band uh, breathe. It helps uh, settle the beat. So what I'll do is I'll play the two feel. I'll, I'll do it on the hi hat first, and then we'll we'll do it on the snare drum. All right. So we'll do a two feel. One, two, three. And the two feel is supported by the two feel in the bass drum. So we would not, we won't play four on the floor in the bass drum. We we'll just play two on the bass drum. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. One, two. All right. And then we'll play it on the ride symbol. Here we go. One, two, three. One, two, one, two. One, two. One, two, one, two. Or we just play one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. It's kind of a dance, you know. So it's, it's almost like a, um, you know, a, 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 a not nah, what's what's the type of dance that'll be like a two beat, you know, like a two step, you know, it's like a two step. And then what you do is you take uh, uh, the, the the two beat on the cymbal, and then you can uh, you know, embellish on the snare. All right. Another groove in big band, another groove in big band that we, uh, we kind of see um, frequently is the conga swing, all right? And I'll demonstrate the conga swing. And it's emulating the addition of a conga player. Uh, but if we don't have a conga player, a lot of times we play conga swing on the high tom of the drums. Here we go. So we're playing two and a four. One, two, three, four, and one, two, three, four, and one. Two on the uh, cross stick, four and on the hi hat. One, two, three, four, and one, two, three, four, and one. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. All right. Another thing? Question? We have about two minutes left. Okay. So okay. I, uh, you gotta get out of here right I away. do have to go. So this is what I'll this is what I'll do. Please, uh, please read uh, the 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 handout that I have with this. Um, uh, if you have any questions, I, I should have told Chris to put it on the uh, on the uh, screen, but I, we didn't talk about it before. But if you, if you want to contact me. You can email me at gwatkins07 at gmail.com. I will, I will we'll put, be glad. We'll put that in the chat, yeah. Okay, please. Yeah. gwatkins07 uh, at gmail.com. I will be glad to set up uh, a time where we can talk 
or, or, or maybe if you're uh, interested in virtual lessons, I, I will give you the whole thing. Every, everything that I know that I've learned over the years, I, I'd be more than happy to share with you guys. Awesome. Thank you so much, Gerald. No problem. Uh, so I'll just go ahead and wrap up r real quick here as we say thank you and you get out of here for your gig. Um, yeah, please, make, <laughs> please make sure that you visit our festival website at mhcc.edu slash jazz festival for the full schedule of remaining events. Um, tonight, there's a concert um, by the Tia Fuller Band at six o'clock. Don't miss that. And uh, I know tomorrow Ingrid Jensen is doing a master class as well. Um, definitely not going to miss that one. Um, and you can purchase festival merchandise at the at the website um, and learn how you can help support the festival in the future. Thank you so much for tuning in this afternoon. And um, hopefully we'll see you at 6 p.m. for Tia Fuller. And join me one more time in thanking Gerald Watkins, Jr. Uh, thank you guys so, so much. So wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you guys. Have a great gig.